Welcome everyone to 1997. Welcome to one of the most kick-ass years in gaming history. The year that brought us the Pentium 2, the AMD K6 and the HEP slot for video cards ushering in a new age of performance, of possibilities and portability with the advent of the lithium-ion battery. Winamp, the best music player ever made, the one that really kicked the llama's ass, was released this year and you think it would have taken over the world had it not been handled by people that were, let's say, not all that bright a couple of years later. This was the year when Steve Jobs returned to Apple to save it from absolute destruction. It was also when Microsoft invested a lot of money into Apple and itself became the most valuable company in the world and Bill Gates was the richest man in the world. Titanic was gearing up to become the most profitable movie in human history. Hong Kong returned to China after years of being under British sovereignty. One of the first web browsers, Mosaic, was discontinued. Yahoo Mail began, the first images from NASA's Mars Pathfinder program logged over 100 million views through the web, leaving a lot of mirror servers so that the internet would not crash. Paywalls became the hot new thing on the web, and a tragic accident claimed the life of Princess Diana of Wales, one that could have probably been avoided were it not for certain vultures. But moving on to video games, this was the year when Jordan Mechnick decided to take his idea of a cinematic experience and apply it into a different genre. The Last Express was an adventure game that took place on the Orient Express, and it was notable for the many outcomes the story could have, coming forth from the many options to interact with the environment that you as a player had, and all of it taking place in real time, meaning that if you miss something at a certain point, you would have to turn back the game clock, which you could actually do because there was a clocking game, to be able to see what happened or to take action. It also had a very distinctive style. It featured rotoscoping, same as Prince of Persia, but on a much larger scale. It sold very poorly back then, mostly due to it being published by Broderbund, at a time when all the people that were working on marketing and sales at the company left the company. Even though it had published some of the most popular games in its time, within a year, Broderbund would be gone. And speaking of things that would soon be gone, even though the arcades were still getting games like Tekken 3, the writing was on the walls. To keep on going, arcades would need to invent new ideas that couldn't be replicated on a PlayStation, because graphically they were already at the same level. But more about that next week, and even with what's gonna happen next year, arcades would dwindle from the top dog to a niche, at least in the West. They were kind of never a thing around here, to be honest, but they're still quite big in the Far East. Something similar can be said about the adventure games as well. Their popularity was dwindling in the USA, though it would hold out indefinitely in Europe and in the lower budget sectors, but they'd seldom sell in the millions like they used to in the old ages. Even so, alongside The Last Express, we got plenty of new adventure games that year. From Blade Runner to Riven, the sequel to Mist, to The Curse of Monkey Island, which was the sequel to Monkey Island 2, Sword Grand Inquisitor, which was a sequel to so Broken Star 2, in general there were a lot of sequels abound. Quake 2, Mortal Kombat 4, they both tried to depart a bit from these styles that made their predecessors successful, with varying degrees of success. Dark Forces a sequel, Jedi Knight, gave us the start of the Jedi simulator genre, where lightsaber and force powers would guarantee you lots and lots of fun, even though it was a departure from the simple shooter that the last one was. The Need for Speed series as well did the same thing, changing I mean. It turned into an arcade game from something that tried to be a bit more of a simulator. And I could actually say that the series started out properly this year with Need for Speed 2. In pure Electronic Arts tradition, it would get a sequel each year until the developer was too tired and work had to be switched to a different different studio with a one-year gap. The company would also do the same with most of its franchises and properties, Wing Commander having its last proper outing this year with Prophecy. The series went from being the next Star Wars to dead within just four years. And I can't really say that the movie that came out 
two years after really helped all that much. Since we're on the subject of sequels, the mother of them all came out this year. Square released a game that made the PlayStation the absolute top dog. Sure, the game was also released on Windows, but there is no mistake on what platform most people played Final Fantasy VII. It was a magnificent game that would become the most beloved title of the series, both because it came at just the right moment when a large enough number of people could play it early enough in their life to remember it forever, and also because it was a genuinely good game, one that tried to advance the formula of the JRPG a bit by adding a kind of a more diverse combat component that featured something called materia which you could link and relink and combine in different very interesting ways. It also had a very great style that blended 2D and 3D with a very detailed and somewhat long system of animations for summoning creatures with great CGI cinematics and of course an absolutely killer CD soundtrack. At least I think it was CD. I think on the PC it may have still been a MIDI soundtrack. And it had multiple CDs actually. A lot of them. It's the game that refined the Final Fantasy series, pushing it into a new direction. The same is true for Castlevania sequel Symphony of the Night. Featuring a style of map design and accompanying gameplay that encourage exploration and methods similar to the Metroid series from a couple of years earlier, hence the term Metroidvania. Though Blood Omen kind of did it too a year earlier. Earlier. It's somehow the genre isn't called Metroidomania. We should call it that as well, I guess. Another sort of sequel uh, came out in the year 1997 as well. The final, well, I wouldn't say final, but the release version of Ultima Online. There were MMOs before it, we've covered that quite a lot in the series. Ones that set up the basics of what an MMO should be, can be, that put forth the ideas and the tenements of the genre. But Ultima Online really set things on fire by being the first one to be called an MMO, not a MMO, like Meridian 59. Ultima Online was a game with so little trust from the publisher Electronic Arts that a developer, Origin Systems, couldn't really ask for more money to send discs to people so the game could be tested. So instead, they charged people 5 bucks to send them the discs. The result was that around 50,000 people paid that $5 tax, which is a kind of a really weird coincidence since the game's budget was just that, $250,000. Basically nothing compared to the millions of dollars, the tens of millions of dollars that Electronic Arts spent on games in the last couple of years that it had kind of already killed, driven into the ground and murderized forever. Even so, within a year, Ultima Online would sell around a million copies and have 100,000 paying monthly subscribers. That's more than what EA or Origin anticipated. That's more than anyone anticipated. Video games with online components that required attacks didn't do this kind of thing. They did not reach this level of popularity. This this was the MMO genre hitting the spotlight for the first time truly, and it never went back. What's very important to note is that Ultima Online did this without any of the modern trappings of the MMO, for good and for ill. This wasn't a theme park MMO, where you would go from one quest to another in a static, unchanging world where everyone's experience would be the same. This was a dynamic, ever-changing medium where players had control over many, many things. They could decide the economy, they could build houses, they could interact with each other in ways that were reminiscent of MUDs from the old days. One very, very amusing instant is that at the end of the beta, somebody set Lord British on fire, while Richard Garrett was having his speech upon a wall of a citadel in front of a crowd of people. One of them set Lord British on fire, and then they all died because a race of demons invaded the uh, server and killed everybody, leaving many to wonder, why dost thou kill us, my lord? Well, the answer is, one of you set me on fire. In a way, the game was maybe a bit too dynamic, allowing the players to change too many bits of the world, because initially, 
It had a living environment simulation where certain types of animals depended on other types of animals to exist. For example, predators needed herbivores. Well, that, that simulation didn't work out because the players killed everything, so they have to disable it. And unlike all of its predecessors, all the games that could call themselves MMOs from back in the day, Ultima Online is still alive and kicking. Sure, its popularity may have decreased a bit in 20 years, but that doesn't change its importance to the genre. And now that we're done with sequels, let's move on to the new and shiny bits. Shiny like MDK, a game made by Shiny, the creators of Earthworm Jim, a fun and quirky shooter that didn't take itself too seriously, but would guarantee you tons of amusement. I can probably say the same about the classic Oddworld Abe's Odyssey, another cinematic platformer created by Oddworld inhabitants with a charming main character and a sound design so good that you could finish it even if you were blind. And that's actually what somebody did once. The Parade of Aces continued in 1997 with Iguana Entertainment's Turok Dinosaur Hunter, a first-person shooter game with attitude, dinosaurs and bows before they were mandated to be in every game. Bullfrog's Dungeon Keeper brought the god game down into the underground, into the dungeons and on the side of evil, letting you indulge your darkest desires as long as they were about digging, slapping and eventually fighting off the avatar from Ultima 8 for some reason. If that wasn't dark enough for you, Stainless Games' Carmageddon let you run over hundreds of pedestrians and ram other cars off the road, all with the twisted objective of having demented fun on your way to victory and if that still wasn't enough for you. A little studio called DMA Design decided to make a little game about stealing cars, running people over, shooting everything in your way, blowing up everything you saw and completing various missions for the criminal underground of three major fictional cities, Liberty City, Vice City and San Andreas. That game was Grand Theft Auto. It was the beginning of probably the most profitable series of video games ever made, at least in terms of density of sales per game, not in the sense that there's one every goddamn year. And if violence wasn't your thing and you liked music, you had Parappa the Rapper, a rhythm game with a rapping paper dog, an onion karate teacher, and a whole lot of other weird things that sort of made you think that maybe you were not in the right frame of mind when you were playing it. Even though there had been quite a few first person shooters on consoles up until now, including some of the ones mentioned here today, Rare's GoldenEye is considered one of the ones that really made the FPS work on consoles, namely on the N64. And how did it do that you may ask? Well, through copious amounts of auto-aim to the point where it is incredibly easy to play with a keyboard for aiming as well. GoldenEye 007 stood out both because it was a really cool adaptation of the new James Bond movie and because it had a great 4 player split screen competitive mode that some people are playing even today. This was a new standard to reach for. Don't like shooters? Okay. The real time strategy genre went above and beyond this year with the fantastic Age of Empires by Ensemble Studios. A game that took you through the ages from the times when people barely learned how to master fire and make stone tools to the glory of the Roman Empire. Created by some of the people that worked on Civilization a couple of years earlier, this game tried to give you a sample of great strategy gaming as well as a few history lessons with its campaign doing its best to show you a small part of the old old world in ancient times. Some some people would call that boring, I mean ancient times, why not do something more modern, why not set it in the future with robots and lasers, why not total annihilation. Cave Dog Entertainment gave players large scale battles with 3D units and a physics simulation behind it that meant that when a bullet hit something, it wasn't just a simplistic graphic representation of a dice roll. The bullet actually traveled from the tank or robot or plane or something to the place it hit and if it found something in its way, it hit that instead. Total Annihilation was unlike Command and Conquer or Warcraft. It was its own thing and it would go on to evolve in new ways bringing massive scale strategy to all those who liked the macro more than the micro. It's many many mods and 
fan expansions would add so many types of units into it that at a certain point you may wonder that maybe there is such a thing as too much. Lastly, there is one sort of sequel that I've neglected to mention so far. It's not an actual sequel, more of a sequel in spirit. A sequel to a post-apocalyptic game called Wasteland that, well, they couldn't call Wasteland 2 because Electronic Arts owned that name. This was Interplay's Fallout, a game that started out as a small side project of a handful of people at Interplay and quickly turned into a magnificent example of role-playing excellence. Fallout was a game about choice, about who you are and how you can change your world once destroyed by nuclear war. Would you bring hope to those you found in your path or would you doom them in an attempt to save your own? Combine that with a system of gameplay that let you pick your own path in just about every way possible, even if it meant playing as a character that couldn't even pick up a gun, or one that was dumb as a sack of bricks. And on top of that, all you had a story with depth to it. Characters with actual motivations behind their actions and excellent dialogue that was more than just a simple yes or no binary choice. It was an excellent game that proved how much can be achieved when design, creativity and freedom met. Fallout set a new standard of quality in RPGs with the added ease of play that may have been lacking from other computer role-playing games from the previous years. We now come to the very important question of what was the game of 1997. What game could best describe this year and left a long-lasting impression on the world, on the industry and on the people that play them in general? Well, here's the problem. There are three games that best fit this criteria. Final Fantasy VII embodies 90s RPGs as most people remember them, at least in terms of what it meant on a console. Fallout embodies the best design RPGs can have, at least when it comes to PCs and well, RPGs in general. And Ultima Online embodies a new breed of game altogether, one that we still enjoy today and could not have existed without this one. They are all games that should have this style but as I've said, I'm not gonna pick more than one. And I'm a bit tempted to give it to Need for Speed 2 since it was the stereotypical racing game I think of from the 90s, or Takarmageddon or Grand Theft Auto, just for the attitude behind them, the rebellious, screw the man feeling they had. And in a way, you know what also had that feeling? Fallout. It's a hard decision, but that's my game of 1997. In terms of sheer quality, of improving the genre, expanding a computer game to be more akin to its pen and paper counterpart, Fallout set the bar high, really high. And even though some would say that Fallout 2 was better, it was so mostly because the base of it, Fallout 1, was great to begin with. So that's how 1997 ends. Come back next week for the birth of a new king, or possibly two. Goodbye.